time for us to begin tonight. Appreciate everybody being here. Let's turn to chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. Bible open here. Okay. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier in our study of 1 Timothy that I'm using a, a guide by Dr. Ralph F. Wilson. I appreciate Dr. Wilson's notes, and he, he's a very good scholar with a lot of thoughts and ideas. I wanted to read something in this introduction. We'll... Uh, We'll read 1 Timothy 5 in its entirety, then go back and do a verse by verse. But he, he mentions, just to kind of give us a heads up, he said, Thus far Paul has shared with Timothy the dangers of false teaching, pointed to areas that need correction, given guidelines to or for leader selection, and pointed to godliness as the goal. In this section, he's talking about chapter 5, he instructs Timothy how to relate to various types of people in the church. So he begins with the old men, the young men, the older women, the young women, older widows, younger widows, sound elders, sinning elders, and then finally slaves, I think, as you get into the next chapter. So what he talks about is how difficult it must be for young Timothy to go into a congregation where he's primarily focusing on the older men who are the elders who are teaching error and so he's saying here's Timothy has youth and sort of inexperienced in how to approach these people and so there's a good chance that when he goes in and he corrects the false doctrine that he might approach them in the wrong way yeah thanks Todd over here okay. how are we doing now can you see me? Can you see me now? <laughs> okay. A little bit more? Yeah, I'm actually a little forward, so. Probably messed up our camera angle. How are we doing now? Okay, I get a thumbs up. All right, thank you. Sorry about that. Those of you that are viewing through Facebook or YouTube, sorry about that, but I should be in camera view now. So, here is this young man who's gone in uh, to a congregation and correcting people. He's inexperienced in exactly how to do it, so he has to be so careful to say something to correct the error, but yet he has to say something. To not say something would be a sin on his part because there's being error taught in the church. So he doesn't want to be too harsh, but yet he has to say something to correct the error. Makes sense. It would be inappropriate for a younger man to rebuke an older man. So then how do you do this? And so we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. And then we'll get into the details of how to handle uh, widows who are in need at the church in Ephesus. All right. Um, I'm just going to ask you, anybody want to read the chapter? Anybody feel like reading tonight? Any brave soul out there? First Timothy 5. Okay, thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. So Jason's going to read with us as we begin 1 Timothy 5, 1 through, looks like it's going to go through, yeah, through 25. All right, if y'all read with Jason, thank you. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. But refuse to put younger widows in the rich. For when they show seeking desires and disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous flesh. At the same time, they also learn to be idle, as they go around from house to house, and not merely idle, but also gossip and busy talking about things not proper to men. Therefore, I want Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that. A lot of information to cover tonight as we get started in our study of 1 Timothy 5. The first thing he does is Paul writes to young Timothy and says, Timothy, I know that you're going to need to correct some false teaching. You have people of all age categories that are going to need to be corrected. So be very careful in how you do this. And so he talks about the older men, the younger men, the older women, and the younger women. He says that you should not rebuke an older man out of respect, but encourage him as you would a father. A younger man, just do it like you would a brother. Be gentle and kind. Uh, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. So he reminds him, if you're dealing with young women especially, be careful in your relationships with them. Because if there's an attraction physically, there could be uh, an allegation of impurity. So watch yourself, in particular, dealing with the younger women. Now, uh, in verse 3, he talks about caring for widows. Why is that important in the church? Anybody have any ideas? Caring for the widows. Is that important to God? We're, yeah, we're commanded. We're actually commanded to do it. Uh, the first thing I thought of, Wes, was Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. Have you got your Bible handy? Okay. Somebody opens Acts 6 1 and read that. That's back in the beginning of the church, right after Pentecost. Let's see what happened. Yeah, Acts 6 1. Okay, the Hellenistic Jews means these were these were Greek or Grecian Jews, non non Jewish, I'm sorry, non Jewish widows who were now part of the church. But the reason these first deacons were appointed in Acts chapter six and verse one, of which Stephen was one, I believe, uh, that these women were being neglected. That they were saying, you know, there's a food distribution program set up for the needy women, the widows. 
in Jerusalem, but these Grecian women are being neglected, so we want you deacons to oversee the distribution of the food. So that was interesting that the first deacons appointed in the church specifically were assigned to oversee the care and feeding of widows. So that's uh, very interesting. James chapter 2 and verse 15, we also are commanded about caring for widows and orphans. And if somebody has their Bible handy, if you'd read James 2.15. James 2.15. Just read that out if you got it. Thank you for reading. All right. So... The idea is that uh, we should care for widows and orphans to give them clothing and food. James 1.27 also says the same thing about caring for, for widows in particular. Um, pure and undefiled religion is to care for widows and orphans in their time of need. So the idea is that if you see a need um, and that need is unmet, then you should be compelled to respond and care for them. However... Uh, having said all that, we need to understand that just because a woman was a widow in the church doesn't necessarily mean she would have a need. So let's talk about some different things that could happen. First of all, uh, in the context of the early church, there was no welfare system, to, so to speak. There was no food stamps, no Medicare, no Medicaid, which a lot of us who are older begin to depend on for assistance. So if a woman's husband passed away and she was getting all up in years and couldn't work, it was very difficult for her to feed herself. She might literally go hungry if it was not for family members who maybe took her in, cared for her, had a room for her. You may recall that when Jesus was on the cross, he asked John, you know, behold your mother, woman, behold your son. He was asking uh, John, the apostle whom Jesus loved, to care for his mom in his absence. After the resurrection, we know he ascended into heaven, and he asked John to pay special attention to his mom. So we have a duty, verse 3, to honor the widows who are truly widows. And what do you think Paul means when he says, honor the widows who are truly widows? What do you think that means? Anybody have an idea? Yeah, great, great point is that duty or obligation comes from their own family first. In other words, when he says a true widow is a widow who doesn't have any immediate family who can care for her. Basically, she would be out on the street and homeless and not have any way to support herself. If there's no family in that area to support her, then that's somebody that we need to immediately step in and help out if she is truly in need. So we have a duty to God, an obligation to care for our own family. Um, that is not the church's primary duty. So what he's saying is to the Christians in the area of Ephesus, look, if you have a mom or a dad who's a widow or widower and they need help, then you have an obligation to care for them, to, to, to be there for them, to help them, and not neglect them. To neglect them is a sin before God. So show, show godliness or earn your raising. He mentions in verse um, 4, I believe, he says, If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness. It is godly to provide for your elderly parents or grandparents. To show godliness to their own household. To make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. I just made a note to myself, it's like earning your raisin back. You know, if you were raised by these people and they help to teach you, to clothe you and feed you, then you have an obligation or a duty to feed them, to care for them. You know, it's kind of sad. I don't know how many of y'all go into nursing homes to visit the elderly people or assisted living uh, or the Alzheimer's units, but sometimes people are just left there, abandoned by their own family, discarded. It's inconvenient. I don't have time to go visit. I don't have time to see you or care for you, and that's really sad in my opinion. It also reminds me that God is watching. 
God is watching if we care for immediate family. So we need to uh, fulfill that duty. Now, it says here, um, she's truly a widow, verse 5, left all alone and has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. In other words, these are the kind of widows that we're very interested in helping, those who demonstrate godliness, who have no one else to care for them, but they've been godly in their life. Now we, in turn, as the church, should help them. But, verse 6, now he's talking about another type of widow, a different widow category. She who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. So what do you think that means? What kind of widow is that describing? A non, yeah, possibly a non-Christian or a widow who's very worldly. One who's more interested in themselves than taking care of others. All right, anybody else? You can probably, in your own personal life, think back to people you've known as you've grown up, people that you've visited and cared for that are widows. Some widows are very loving, caring, very gracious, and have done a lot of ministry to others in need. And then you have other widows who may be all focused on themselves and amassing things and not interested in caring for other people at all. So you have to kind of ask yourself, if we have widows in the church today, are they category one, the godly kind, who, are, who have spent a life serving and ministering, or are they one that's sort of affluent, that has uh, followed things of the flesh and not uh, served the Lord? So be careful, I think, uh, how we treat those widows and think about their life. So he says in verse 7 to Timothy, command these things as far as care for the widows so that they may be without reproach. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So what, what Paul is saying is, look, church, even the unchurched, even the pagans out there, understand that there's a moral obligation to care for your family. You have a duty. And if you neglect that duty, the pagan world is going to look at you and say, you know, that's immoral. That's unethical. You should care for your own family. And that would go, I would say, for anyone, a mom who, who neglects her family. You know, it shocks me sometimes, but I hear about cases where a woman... Uh, romantically gets involved with somebody else other than her husband and she will pack up everything and abandon her children and abandon her husband and she's gone. Uh, I've heard of men who, same thing, got involved with a woman, just packed up their bags and left, left a wife and children at home. I believe God is watching carefully how we treat those who we've made a commitment to care for. So we have to be careful. We have to realize that there are duties and obligations when we enter those relationships. In this case, if anybody in the church has a widow that they should be caring for, they must provide for them. Because he says that you've denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever if you neglect your own family. Any thoughts on that? Pretty clear? Just a reminder. Now, a widow is not automatically qualified to receive assistance from the church here in 1 Timothy 5. So let's find out what qualifications she needs to meet, starting in verse 9. Let a widow, he says to Timothy, be enrolled if she's not less than 60. Why do you think there's an age limit there? Anybody have an idea? Yeah, Dennis? Yeah, they're still kind of interested in love and a relationship and finding a husband. So sometimes the younger widows tend to be a little more problematic. For example, a younger widow, according to Paul, may be somebody who goes from house to house, somewhat of a busybody and a gossip and is involved in things. She's still young enough to have energy 
and get out and do things. She's just not engaged in things that are godly. She may be looking for a husband. She may be shopping through the congregation to try to snatch a man somewhere, right? So be careful. Be careful of these younger widows who are still interested in romance. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing for a widow to remarry. As a matter of fact, Paul says, while she may not be put on the list, he talks in a few minutes about um, the, young, the younger widows, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute in verse 11. So if a woman in the church is going to be on the list of being supported by the church, she has to be 60 years of age or greater, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation for good works. Now, in this case, she needs to have brought up children. That's interesting. She has to have been a mom, shown hospitality, washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, devoted herself to every good work. So it's safe to say that if we go through and evaluate various widows in the church, there would be some who qualify for assistance, some who would not based on their lifestyle. He says in verse 11, pretty, pretty strong language here, refuse to enroll younger widows. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry. And so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. So what he's saying is, young widows, if you're not careful in your, in your zeal to find a man, to feel that emotional need, to be romantically involved with a man again, you tend to abandon, to walk away from your relationship with Jesus. So he says, um, in addition to that, there's a tendency, uh, an inclination to learn to be idlers going about from house to house, gossips, busybodies, saying that they should, what they should not. So, verse 14, he concludes, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their own households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. Engage your life in the things that a younger woman should. Let's say that a, uh, a woman's husband dies maybe at work. There may be a construction accident. A young widow is left all by herself. It's fine, he says, remarry. But do it in Christ. Do it in a godly way. Go ahead and raise your family. And be careful not to give an opening to the devil by walking away and abandoning your relationship with Jesus. And that's what he means, give the adversary, the devil, no occasion for slander. Verse 15, for some, some of these young widows, he says, have already strayed after Satan. All right, any thoughts on that? Does a young woman have to marry? I don't think it would be a sin for her not to marry, but she needs to be careful to keep those, those emotions and those desires under control. Paul talks about being a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. It's, it's not a sin to not marry. As a matter of fact, it's commendable, desirable in some cases to remain single if you can focus all of your energy on serving the Lord. But some people, and it depends on how you're wired, how you're put together. Some people need a spouse. Some people need a relationship, somebody to be with for companionship, and there's nothing wrong with that. But in either case, whether single or married, serve the Lord and do it faithfully. Stay focused on your relationship with Jesus first and foremost. So remember that the widows are not automatically signed up just because they're a widow, and that shows prudence. It shows that you have to research and, and review each widow in the church on a case-by-case -case basis. I feel sorry for Timothy because in some cases we think uh, there was a very good chance some of these widows had gone off and neglected their faith, maybe pursued other men in the church, had followed false teachers and been led astray. So he, he really has his work cut out for him for these young widows that have uh, slipped away. You think America does a good job as a society in caring for the elderly? 
Okay, why would, why would you say that, Roy? That didn't take long to answer. You had a pretty strong opinion. Okay, so maybe, maybe as a country we're focusing on big capital spending projects and, and maybe not caring for the needs of some of the elderly as, as well as we should, in, in your opinion. Yep. Mm -hmm. I was watching a, a movie the other day. I think it was filmed in South America, or at least that was a context. But it was interesting to watch this remote village in, in, the, in the jungles of South America and how they treated their elderly, you know, like, the tribal chief or the or the elders in the village but i heard words like father you know when they when they addressed the senior people and and i'm afraid we may be becoming a society this is my opinion we may be becoming a society who tends to neglect and not respect the elderly uh, there's not an automatic respect for the gray hair and and our elderly people are the ones who worked hard to provide for this current generation they laid the foundation. I think back to World War II and some of those veterans who served and how honorable they were and loving their country and making some sacrifices for us. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. The strength of the family unit. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going back to the Waltons. <laughs> you know? Grandma, Grandpa, and, and, and it was really a wonderful, very strong family unit. They, they went through difficult times together and good times together, but they were together, and, and they had an inherent respect for Grandma. She was a very important part of that family, and Grandpa was too. Yes. Yeah, great point. Yeah, so it is our moral duty as people of God to care for our elderly, for our own family. And if we neglect them, I think God is watching. I think there will be a price to pay if we neglect family. Yeah. My comments are really talking about the people here at the church. Okay. I know several families where Yep. Yes. Right. A day of reckoning. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. 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 
We have to be wise, don't we, and discern. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, I've heard a saying is, as goes the family, so goes the country. And I think any, any of the Christian organizations like Focus on the Family, uh, and then you've got your American Family Association that also is a very conservative Christian-based organization, they will tell you that one of the problems in our nation as a country is the disintegration of the family unit. If you want to go back to your school systems and see who your problematic children are, they're the ones that don't have a dad present or a mom present who are not teaching their children values and being role models. And that is a breakdown of, of our country. And I saw a news article recently that was just so encouraging. I don't know if y'all saw this, but there was a bunch of uh, minority dads. They were people of color, right? These young professional men who were businessmen. But they all set aside time to go into the school system. They were almost like hall monitors, and they got to know each kid by name. And they would require them to behave themselves, stand up, tuck in their shirt tail, and they would, they would make them toe the line and behave and treat each other kindly. And, and so this uh, media group that was reporting about these volunteer dads, right, that were being dads to everybody at school, the kids were going, we love this. We love the fact that they're here, they're present, they love us, they talk to us, they get to know us by name. We have these relationships with them. And there's this sense of peace over the whole school because they're present. And I thought, yeah, you, I mean, this was like very encouraging story that these dads were volunteering to be there, not for their own children alone, but for all the kids who needed role models to see what real men acted like. I'm like, good for you. Yeah, it was just so encouraging. So in, I know we're getting a little bit off subject, but the, the importance of caring and loving and respecting the elderly in our country is so important to God. And I hate to kind of see as a society, as Jason pointed out so well, us begin to neglect and be too busy to care for our own family members, the elderly. Anybody else? Thank you, Jason. Oh, yes, Warren. That's a, that's a very interesting question, Warren. Um, I think if that's a request that maybe a father has made to his children and he feels very strongly about that, I would say, Warren, this is just my opinion, and y'all are welcome to disagree with me, but I would say in order to honor their father, they should probably try to the best of their ability to make that happen. If they, if they can financially afford it, you know, that's sometimes... Um, Skilled level, level nursing care is extremely expensive. Um, some of you have been involved in this. I've talked to you. We're talking thousands and thousands of dollars per month. But if it's possible, and let's say the father has already made plans to provide for some of that care himself, then I would say the child has a duty to honor that father's request to the best of their ability, but still not be negligent to be very attentive and caring for the father in some type of facility if that is in fact his request i think that would they would have a duty or obligation to honor that so yeah i don't see that as being wrong at all but again that's just one person's opinion it makes sense yeah and i was that that's just my right off the cuff that's my initial thought dennis okay Yes. I remember that. Yeah. We had scripture reading and prayer every morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we kicked God out of the schools, didn't we?
Yeah. Yep. I think, if I'm not mistaken, if you go back and look in the 60s, Mad Madeline Murray O'Hare had a lot to do with uh, encouraging school administrators to no longer read the Bible. And uh, wow, what a, what a corrupting influence she had on the direction and course of our country to undermine godliness, which we so desperately need today. And I find it interesting that Madeline Murray O'Hare's, well, first of all, she had a very strange disappearance, death, right? It was almost a violent end. And secondly, one, I think one of her sons or her son has basically become a believing um, New Testament following Christian because he sees the value of what his own mother tried to destroy back in the 60s by getting, eliminating God in our school system. Just interesting how that's come full circle. So you can go online and read the story of her and her son, but I find that very interesting. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's fine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's a great point. And, and thank you for reminding me and, and correcting me to remember that we have godly teachers in our school systems who are making a difference, even though they may not be able to hold the Bible up and read it aloud in class, they can still live it. And, you know, Meg would on occasions as a teacher get a question from a child about the Bible, and she would answer as honestly as she could. She didn't initiate the question, but, but she would talk to the, uh, to the, to the children about um, God. Now, I remember one time, it was kind of sad, Meg was walking by a little girl's desk, and she was coloring a rainbow, and Meg said, oh, that's such a beautiful rainbow. And she says, oh, Miss Payne, do you know what the rainbow represents? And she went down a completely different story that her two mothers had taught her, and it just kind of was sad. Meg goes, well, that's not the rainbow that I read about in my Bible, and maybe you could study that as well. But, you know, we're at war, aren't we? I mean, the devil is in school systems trying to corrupt our children and, and, and pollute their minds, and um, our teachers see it every day. So we thank God for our godly little teachers and who help. I appreciate some of you are on not on Facebook. Some of you quit Facebook, but I read it from time to time, and I always appreciate Mandy Chadwick's lessons from the schoolroom. And if you're on Facebook, try to read those sometimes because Mandy is doing a wonderful job instilling love into these little children who may not have any love at all and telling them that they matter and that they need to be nice, they need to be kind to one another. And she gets a lot of feedback from these children in the lunchroom because Miss Mandy loves them and they know that she loves them. So we appreciate people like Miss Mandy and our other teachers and school workers and lunchroom workers who are teaching Jesus Christ in our public schools. So, yeah. Yes. Great. For the Good News Club. That's wonderful. Glad to hear that. Yeah. So there's good things happening. I know, um, I want to say it's focus on the family. Each year is doing Bring Your Bible to School Day, um, where kids bring, bring their, their Bibles with them and have a little devotional. So they do that on a particular day every year, and it's growing. So we're excited here about these initiatives to keep God in the school system, even though some people try to kick him out. Um, one time, I think Meg had an administrator in school tell her that she, she shouldn't wear the cross, you know, on her lapel or necklace. And she said, I have every right to wear it, and I'll continue to wear it because we all know what the cross means, and I'm not ashamed of that at all, and that's none of your business. So <laughs> anyway, he tried and failed to suppress her faith. All right, any other thoughts or comments? We... Uh, We've talked quite a bit about widows down to verse 16. We've, we've looked at 
some of the, the dangers of, of the younger widows turning from the faith, maybe following into a relationship that is carnal. And Paul addresses these widows again and talks about some of these widows who have been um, influenced and taught by false teachers and corrupted. So we'll, we'll run into this again later in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. But in verse 17, and we're almost out of time, but uh, verse 17 we see here where Paul is shifting his attention now to the elders of the church. It's such a critical position in, in our leadership to have Bible-based, solid elders who are teaching the truth. And, and sadly, in some congregations, not Stroudsville, but in some congregations, we have men who are in leadership roles who should not be in leadership roles who are actually teaching error. Um, so w what do you do in those cases? Well, this is, this is what happened at Ephesus. We have false teachers, young Timothys coming in and having to correct them. So Paul reminds Timothy, verse 17, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. And I just made a note to myself as I was reading this. I said, you know, if you follow the logic, if he's, he, he's delineating or pointing out that some of the men in the congregation rule well, is it safe to assume that there are some who don't? Think about it. Why would he bring it up? Let those who rule well be worthy of double honor. So in other words, there are some who rule well, there are some who don't rule well. And Paul is getting ready to give him specific instructions about what to do in those cases. So some congregations out there may have men who are in leadership roles who are not ruling well, and they need to be dealt with. The church can't afford to let them continue to be in a position where they're inflicting harm spiritually. So those who do rule, rule well be considered worthy of double honor. Support them, love them, honor them, tell them how much you appreciate them. And Paul says specifically, uh, if these men are involved in two things, if they're involved in preaching and teaching, then that's a good thing and pleasing. So if you have shepherds, if you have leaders, elders in your church that are doing these things, then honor them. Now, we're going to talk in a few minutes about what exactly does it mean to honor. Some say that this uh, being worthy of double honor literally means they should be supported, supported financially. And I say that because verse 18, look where he goes in his next statement. The scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, the laborer deserves his wages. So in other words, uh, I think what he's saying is there are some men who are leading you and doing it well. They're involved in teaching and preaching, but they may need, because they're spending more time serving the church and not necessarily working in a vocation, they may need some assistance financially. So what do you think? Is that okay for the church to support an elder? I see one head nodding. Okay, I see another head nodding. What do you think? That's what the Bible says. Pardon? That's what the Bible says, right? So there are some congregations who actually have men that are considered staff elders. Brother, we need you. We need you to visit families. We need you to go out and counsel of those who've gone out into the world. Maybe, maybe there's a congregation that has some women who are now elder, uh, widows who are beginning to go out and be involved in fleshly carnal activities. Brother, we, we need you to talk to these sisters, right? Because they're leaving the church. They're getting involved in things that are harmful and destructive to their soul. Would you talk to them and counsel them? And by the way, we know this is taking up a lot of your time during the week, we'd like to help support you financially while you do this. Would you like an office in the church building with a phone where you can use it for study and counseling and, and come in two or three days a week? 
that's it's very scriptural and i like the idea of having a staff elder we need leaders in the church who are involved so think about it mm -hmm. two of the eight paid okay was it like a part-time salary a little stipend yeah, I, I really like that. I like the idea of helping an elder out as he travels around and spends his gas money and maybe has to have meals or, you know, food expenses. I think that's wonderful for the church to help support them. And again, as Jim pointed out, I think this is a biblical concept. Uh, go back and read again. Um, the scripture says, you should not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain while he's walking and treading. Of course, he has the right to eat what he's walking on. Uh, the laborer deserves his wages. So we're going to pick up next week at verse 19. It looks like we're out of time, but thank you for your input and your thoughts. I really enjoyed the discussion on the status of our nation and the status of our schools as well. He's fast, isn't he? <laughs> hey, Thad. doing the song you got somebody to lead prayer huh okay how about if i get roy Invitation song is number 591. I could have looked on the screen, you know. He's able to deliver thee. Well, I had an interesting experience I wanted to share with you. I was doing some Bible reading, and I came across uh, a little bit of a puzzling verse, and I'd ask you to turn with me to Mark 1. And we're going to be reading starting in verse 41, Mark 1, 41. This is sort of early in Jesus' ministry. And it involves a leper, we'll actually start with 40, but it involves a leper who comes to Jesus. The Bible says, a leper came to him imploring him and kneeling, said to him, if you can, or if you will, you can make me clean. Now, verse 41 in the English Standard Version says, moved with pity. He stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Anybody got the NIV? Wow. Nobody has the NIV tonight. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to flip over real quick. That's one nice thing about electronic Bible. I can change translations. So I'm going to go over to the NIV. I say I will. Yeah, here it is. Um, Verse 41, it says, Jesus was indignant. That's a different meaning, isn't it? What does indignant mean? Indignant means you're frustrated, angry, like defiant. Why would I heal you? That's what indignant means. NIV, I think, got it wrong, didn't they? So what do you do in these cases? A little bit of a Bible translation lesson. What do you do in these cases where you have different translations that use different words what do you do? You go back to the what? Greek. If you're in the New Testament, you go back to the Greek. If you're in the Old Testament, you go back to the Hebrew. So let's find out what the word is in verse 41. When Jesus saw a man who suffered with leprosy, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Was Jesus indignant? Or is Jesus moved with compassion? Now, the Greek word, just so you'll know, I'm going to try to say this right. It's splagnisomai. Splagnisomai, that's the Greek. That doesn't really matter, but the Greek word is also used 
in the, in the story of the prodigal son. Anybody remember when the, when the father saw the prodigal son returning home? What did the father do? He ran. Guess what word is used for that? When the father saw the son, he had splagnus oh my. Is that indignant? Nope. It's compassion. But see, Splagnisomai, this is based on an article written by a CEO for Adventist Healthcare. Really a neat article. He said, Splagnisomai is an interesting Greek word because splagna means internal organs. I'm like, boy, this is getting really interesting. Splagma means uh, internal organs. Here's the idea. When something hits you in your gut and you're literally moved, right? You feel such deep compassion, you feel it in your stomach. Anybody been there before? I felt compelled. I had to do something. I had to move in a direction because I was so hit with a strong feeling of compassion that I had to do something. That is splagnis, oh my. That's what Jesus felt. Now, why do I bring all this up? I bring all this up because the idea for us as Christians is that we have compassion. We have splagnis, oh my. We have far more than pity. We physically feel the need to do something. When you see a person that's hurting, have compassion for them that moves your literal gut. Splagnisomai means a visceral, gut-wrenching emotional response that is so strong we are physically moved to action. So if you happen to be reading the NIV and you come across Mark 1, Jesus was not indignant. They got it wrong. Jesus was moved with compassion at a gut level. He had to do something because he felt so strongly. And my challenge to you, I want you to feel that. I want you to feel compassion so strong that it hits you in the gut, that you have to do something. You can't idly stand by and watch someone in need and do nothing. And that's your challenge tonight. Let your compassion move you. You have to do something. Have splagness of mind. Be moved with compassion. Jesus was that kind of person, and we should be that kind of person. If you're struggling in your walk with Jesus tonight, or maybe you've grown a little lax in your Christian duty, We're going to sing an invitation song. He's able to deliver thee. We ask you to stand and sing while Gentry leads us.
All right, be seated, please. We have a few announcements we want to share with you. Um, I did want to give one update on the sick. Uh, our sister Nancy Sharp, her son, and I had written his name down, but I don't see it right now, but he's the one on the prayer list. Wendell, yeah. Nancy was telling me today she called just to say that he has been put on suicide watch. So he's really, really having a hard time. And he's at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville in their um, mental health unit on suicide watch. So she's just asked for our prayers tonight. So Roy's going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment. But if you remember Nancy's uh, son who is on suicide watch, we'd appreciate that. He's, he is in our prayer list but I had um, failed to write it down on this paper. Um, there's a Christmas party coming up for grades 6 through 12. That's Saturday, December 11, 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. You can see Ryan Blunt. We'll sing Christmas carols at Dogwood Bend. That's this coming Saturday. And uh, I think that'll be around 2 or 2.30. Anybody know the time? 2.30. Okay, thank you. Dogwood Bend. That is the assisted living facility. They really enjoy the singing. We hope that you can make it. We also have a singing uh, next Saturday. Uh, so this coming Saturday and one Saturday week. We meet at 225. Bring a mask just in case the facility still requiring one. So just remember that. Elders have talked about a time change. We've had several that approached them about maybe meeting a little earlier. So uh, Sunday night... Let's see, beginning December 12th, Sunday night is now going to be held at 5 p.m., and we're going to review this through Daylight Savings, and then they'll make a decision if it's permanent or not, but that will help some of our older members as they drive. Wednesday night, we'll be moving from 7 to 6.30, and uh, that, will, that will begin on December 15th. So basically, the next two services, Sunday night and Wednesday night, will bump up to those earlier times. All right. Um, there's angel tree gifts that we're wrapping up. We need those uh, by this Sunday out in the hall. We thank you for, for all that you've done to help with the family that we're helping. Uh, we'll be delivering fruit baskets this Sunday after morning services. If you're interested in that, we'll be having a, a little potluck. And um, also we're going to do Christmas caroling and, and deliver those fruit baskets to some of our older members. You can... Uh, I think ride the bus and probably let, we have a sign-up list in the foyer if you want to help with the caroling, a little potluck. It's always something we've done several years, a lot of fun. So a busy Sunday, a lot going on. Annual favorite things a holiday party will be Sunday, December 12th in the evening service, right after evening services in the fellowship hall. Ladies bring an appetizer, five things that you can exchange. You can see Katie if you have more questions or Christy Albright. Christmas card exchange, y'all probably seen the little filing system set up in the foyer under the table. Uh, if you want to distribute Christmas cards and don't need to use stamps, but send to people here at church, you can put them in that, in, that, um, in that filing system, and you can also get cards as well. So it's a nice way to avoid postage. Uh, finally, Challenge Youth Conference is for students grades uh, 6 through 12. CYC will be at Pigeon Forge. The dates are February 25 through 27, 35 per person. There's a sign-up sheet on the youth board. You can make, uh, give your payment to Ryan Blunt. The deadline for that is December 26. Make your check payable to Stroudsville. What's our count tonight? 92. Great. Good count. Now, yes. Yes. Yeah, she had successful eye surgery. She'll be recovering. I don't think she can drive for five days. She's being, yeah, kind of keeping still. And But anyway, the surgery went well. Thanks for that, reminding me that Miss Judy's done well. Glenn's taking care of her at home as well. So I know she appreciates all the prayers that we've lifted up on her behalf. Thank you for reminding me. I appreciate it. Anyone else on health updates or any prayer requests? Yes. Ooh. What grade? 
first or second grade. So a friend of yours who's a school teacher lost a child. Yeah, lost a child that's in her class. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sure Roy's writing all these down. We'll remember that in our prayer tonight. Thank you, Roy, for filling in and praying for us and remembering these names. Any other announcements as we close? I went a little bit over. I'm sorry about that. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. So remember Miss Kay as she has her pacemaker replaced. Yeah, you don't want to mess that up. Denise is having an MRI tomorrow on her. Hand. Yes, Nancy is supposed to have her surgery. Uh, she was trying to find somebody to take her. I think she's going to try her son. I said, Nancy, if you can't, let me know. We'll make sure we get you to the to Nashville for that for that surgery procedure. So, all right, a lot of people to remember. Roy, you want to lead us in prayer? All right, thank you for writing down all those names. Y'all be safe going home, and thank you for being here tonight. God bless you, and uh, we'll be dismissed after Roy's prayer. Let us pray. <clears throat> Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Dear Lord, we humbly come before you, and we seek your help. And we seek your kindness, and we seek that the example that Christ set, that the Spirit might bring that forth into us. Dear Lord, we have a few folks that need prayers. Nancy Sharp, uh, her son Wendell is on suicide watch. Besides working with this, Nancy's also going to be going in for surgery. We're asking, dear Lord, if you put your hand up on them and allow them to get the comfort and healing that they need to make it through this arduous time. We also ask that you bring forth unto us if there's anything that we need to do on our part to serve you and to bring them together and better. We ask that you be with Judy Sipman during her uh, recovery from the eye surgery uh, in her rehab. We ask that you uh, put your healing hand upon her and allow that she will come through and, and be able to see as well. And we ask dear Lord that as we, that, that she would know that we love her and we look into do what we can to help her as she needs it. We ask, dear Lord, that you be with the family of Jace and the loss of their first grader, their son. We ask that you comfort them and you allow them to know that they are loved and that you have a watchful eye upon them. We ask that you be with... Uh, Lisa's Aunt Shorty in the, in the, in the death and the comforting of uh, her nephew, that you comfort them and bring forth and allow them to be gathered to know that they are one in you. We ask that you be with Jennifer's mom and also with Denise as she goes forth for her MRI. Dear Lord, we also ask that you be with all of us as we speak and we raise our children. We ask that you allow us to see the pull that Satan has and pull him from his arms and bring him forth that they may serve you. We ask, dear Lord, as we struggle and we try to make it from day to day with all the bad news that's going around, that you open our eyes that we may see the goodness that would be abound us, and that we may see the work that we can do 
to shed light on the world around us. And dear Lord, we ask that you be with us as we depart. We ask that you allow us to return safely. And we ask that as we participate in the worldly activities that we remember and you instill it in our soul that we are, we are of the world, in the world, but we're not of the world. That we're of you and your son Jesus Christ with the guidance of your Holy Spirit. This we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen.